My name is David Mayer. I'm a senior technical project manager at Fictive. For this teardown, we're joined by our friends at 219 Design to tear down the Segway Drift W1 e-skates. The Drift W1 e-skates are kind of like a hoverboard cut in half, so each side is independent. And there's definitely a bit of a learning curve to get used to them, but once you kind of get the hang of it, they're actually a lot of fun to ride. One of the big questions we'll be looking at is whether these are a gift, uh, a temporary toy, or whether they're real last mile transportation or somewhere in between. We'll also be looking at what is driving the weight limit on these skates and what the internal structure looks like. To get into kind of whether these are a gift or a real solution, we want to take a look at the reliability of these things. Are they made to take a beating and put in some miles or are they going to break apart if you hit a pothole? And also look at the scale that these are made to be made at. Is this a low volume product that they're only going to sell a couple thousand of? Or is this a high volume product that they want to have in streets and cities across America? Yeah, so here's a very simple, inexpensive part done in magnesium casting with these four very inexpensive rubber grommets, but clearly put in there with the intention of reducing vibration and long-term riding fatigue. So maybe this actually is a last mile solution, not just a toy around the house. This is meant to be somewhat water resistant. Yeah. That's where that goes. I mean, this is a sealed connection box. And more and more I'm seeing that you would not go through this design effort if you did not say like, yeah, someone's gonna ride this through a puddle. Yep. This is not just for your living room. So the rest of this wow, is just chassis. Wow, that's light. Feel that. Yeah, yeah, it really was just most of the weight is the motor. So, very interesting piece of cast magnesium. The only post-cast machining operations that they did was drilling and tapping these holes in three orientations in a milling machine. They did not even have to resurface or align the axle seat and yoke. So they kept the magnesium machining operations, which can get expensive and possibly dangerous to a minimum. Aha! Huh. <clears throat> That's cool. This one certainly feels like it has been pressed on. As an ease of assembly step, this one is not pressed on and instead is a, a hand fit um, so kind of a probably a locational fit to save some assembly time. On this shaft, which was made on a lathe, the bearing surface is nicely polished possibly, or at least finished very finely. Everything else has been done very roughly where no one would see it. This weighs a ton. Why? Why? They gotta make sure that the motor coils don't ever hit those magnets, yes, but are as close to the magnets as possible, right? Because you're gonna get more torque that way and more um, efficiency. Wow. Yeah, so this is a part that was die cast uh, and then had the important surfaces machined out. Uh, then it was powder coated, laser engraved, and then they came back and pressed in a bearing. Um, which is really interesting because if, instead of just machining this from scratch from bar stock, they decided to make a casting, which means that they wanted to make a lot of these overall, and that that was worth it to make a tool to die cast rather than just machine from bar stock. It's likely that they can die cast these holes in place, in which case it can all be done on a lathe from one side. Yeah, and that one, the having to do it in two setups and the extra fixture required for that would definitely jack up the price of this a lot more, but if they can keep it to just one operation, then that seems pretty economical. We do have three Hall Effect sensors, which is typical, uh, what we would expect. So there's one right there, one right there, and one right there. Um, and they kind of just wedged them right in there. I mean, they're pretty small. So they just, uh, looks like they had to machine a little bit out of the housing just to kind of stick them in there maybe, and then glue them in place. And that is how they're doing the motor control. So someone went through some effort to customize their electronic component supplier. These yeah. are not usual off the shelf Hall effect sensors. Yeah, and the thing that interests me is looking at a bunch of other kind of last mile solutions. A lot of them use very similar like off the shelf motors. If you look at a bunch of electric scooters, you can see the front wheels all the same. This is completely not off the shelf. Here, we've got all of our motor driver chips, which are going to get quite hot. 
And so what they've done here, they've, they've added this feature um, on this magnesium cast part, just there, and this thermally conductive piece of adhesive tape purely for purposes of dissipating all that heat into the chassis itself. So now that we've got the chassis open, we can start to explore the main electronics. Uh, first thing is the big chip, uh, which is the main processor. Exploring the label, we know that it's an ARM 32-bit Cortex-M4, which is pretty typical these days for a product like this. This chip over here is driving the gates for the uh, motor driver chips. So just part of the motor driver circuitry. Over here, we've got the battery management chip, and that's doing over voltage, over current, temperature monitoring, um, charging of the battery and regulating all of that. And we're not entirely sure, but we suspect that these chips down here at the bottom are accelerometers and possibly a gyro chip, and that these are what's doing the sensing of the tilt and how these e-skates stabilize themselves. Yeah, so here we have a chassis, which really does weigh like nothing. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then we've got neat design. They, uh, they do this little triangular shape, right? And they use those little triangle pockets on the either side of the wheel to put three cells each that are right in here of lithium ion batteries. It looks like there are two slots to add an extra 18650 cell on either side of this battery chassis. That was probably done because in the early design cycles, there are so many variables as the motor, clearly a custom motor was being designed, its resistance, its voltage needs are still being worked out. They didn't want to box themselves into having only six cells in their battery. They wanted some extra design space, really. Then when they got their motor optimized enough, they found out they did not need it. And so they did not populate these two slots with additional cells. So uh, we've completed the teardown of the Segway Drift W1 e-skates. At the beginning of this, we had three questions we wanted to answer. So the first question was, um, there's a weight limit that we read about uh, before purchasing these and trying them out. And at first we thought, right, maybe that was related to the strength of the materials and design. Uh, well, when we were doing the teardown, we thought maybe that was even because the hub motor, which takes all the weight, might actually start to deflect and then it might not actually operate properly. And then very late in the teardown, uh, Trevor noted that, oh, there's also a slope limit. At a certain point, the motor is just not gonna be strong enough to carry somebody up a hill. Got us thinking that it's, it's structurally, it's very solid. Uh, we don't think any of these parts are gonna break because of the weight, but um, at a certain point, the motor's just not strong enough unless you've made the motor bigger and obviously that's a design trade off there, right? While it is limited by slope, we we're also trying to see if this is really a robust vehicle or if this is a toy and sort of a flash in the pan kind of holidays toy. So three things that really stood out to us. One is that all the screws have thread lock around them. The weatherproofing on this is done very tightly, including this, you know, this one way intense seal of the battery case and uh, all the silicone over molding that we've seen here. And then also overall, just the use of metal as opposed to plastic. It's all cast magnesium lathed steel, more lathed steel parts, and, and cast aluminum. This really is a, a robust thing. And the bearings. Um, and the bearings, the use of bearings instead of bushings. This is a, a well-built vehicle. Yeah. And that leads into kind of the answer to our third and final question, which was what scale is this intended to be made at? Is this a something they're only gonna do a couple thousand of, or do a high volume run of? And uh, all the manufacturing processes and designs you seem to indicate that this is a high volume run. There are parts that are cast and then machined. Uh, everything that is machined is uh, optimized for a quick cycle time, uh, basically showing that they want to be able to churn these out in high volume and have them sell very well. So from Fictive and 209 Design, thanks for joining us for this teardown. If you enjoyed it and would like to see more, please visit our website at fictive.com and go to the blog section. I'm going to be on YouTube.